Hey everyone, um, I'm Ryan, and it's great to see a couple of familiar faces in here as well. Um, so, I yeah, I studied industrial design and mechanical engineering, and graduated at the end of 2018. And as Jane mentioned, was the Australian national winner and the international runner-up of, of the James Dyson Award last year. So, I guess I'm here just to give you guys a bit of insight into my experience with the James Dyson Award what my journey has been like with Gecko Tracks and I guess, you know, my journey in from being a student to designer and then, you know, running a startup at the moment. So I just thought I'd give you a quick, uh, show you a quick video of, of Gecko Tracks, give you a bit of an insight of what the product is, how it works, um, and then I can sort of delve into what that design process looked like a bit after. So share my screen with you. You got sound coming through there, Jane? Yeah. My name's Ryan Tilly, I'm 23 years old. I designed the Gecko Tracks tyres, which is a portable and affordable wheelchair accessory that retrofits around any standard wheelchair. There are 75 million people in the world that need or use a wheelchair, and these people find it extremely challenging to access the great outdoors. Some of the challenges that wheelchair users face is not being able to go anywhere that I'd like to on soft off-road terrains, having to take big bulky equipment. And the biggest thing is just being excluded from social activities. And I want to change that. I first became aware of the problem when I met my friend Hoy and saw firsthand some of the challenges he faced in accessing the beach. Current devices on the market are not affordable, aren't portable, and don't provide the freedom for a wheelchair user to go everywhere that I'd like to. The profile of the tyres was actually inspired by a gecko's foot spreading out. The profile expands when in contact with the ground, allowing the wheel to go across soft off-road terrains. For us, the design process is all about really understanding the problem. The prototypes have allowed us to make the design as simple and as intuitive as possible. Putting myself in the position of a wheelchair user and working with Hoi, my business partner, with first-hand experience. One thing that distinguishes Gecko Tracks is that it is fully sustainable and recyclable. But the biggest thing is, is that Gecko Tracks allows independence for wheelchair users with the ability to be able to fit the Gecko Tracks tyres themselves while still seated in the wheelchair. The James Dyson Award has been a great platform in helping us create awareness around accessibility and inclusion for wheelchair users. Good design for me should be seamless and it should be invisible. It should put the user first, and it should be a great combination between aesthetics and function. For us, Gecko Tracks is just the beginning. We want to create a fun, exciting outdoor brand that uses design to create great products that enable people to access and enjoy the great outdoors. Just a bit of an overview of, of what Gecko Tracks is, how it works, and you know, really why we designed it. So um, I thought I'd, I'd just kick off today with, I guess, why we're here as you know as designers or engineers or or as business people like we're really here we're to solve problems and problems for people um and i think really that starts really just starts with um empathy and and really understanding what what that problem is that you know we're solving for people and so with having empathy you know there's a there's a quote here that i like it's seeing with the eyes uh, of another, listening with the ears of another and feeling with the heart of another. And to me, that sort of sum, sums up exactly what empathy is. It's, it's walking in, in someone else's shoes. And so for me, that process of, of empathy and beginning to understand the problem of a wheelchair user, not being a wheelchair user myself, um, began back in, in 2016 uh, when I attended a, a summer and in Singapore and actually spent three days in a wheelchair getting around Singapore and it was sort of at that point that I was just like man I can be I can be using my skills in industrial design and mechanical engineering to be helping people and I guess growing up in in regional Australia I've always had a great love for getting outdoors and uh, I guess having that ability to go out and explore things and I quickly realized that as a wheelchair user Many of those opportunities that I'm blessed with and that I take for granted, they're not accessible. And so 
from this, I began a great, you know, great friendship with my now business partner, Hoi, um, who was a wheelchair user. And the idea for Gecko Tracks really come from his personal experience of living near the beach, but not actually able to access the beach easily. So that was, that for us was the beginning of Gecko Tracks in, in 2018. And so I started Gecko Tracks and it sort of became a final year project throughout university um, and then, then a bit of a side project. And from, from that, I've sort of been able to, uh, I guess, understand even more deeply some of the challenges people face by talking to each other wheelchair users. And then from that, as you can see, that's the product. We've been able to take that from, I guess, a design and an idea. And we're right now through to manufacturing and, and sales. So for us, the design process really followed five key steps being you know, empathy, defining exactly what, so understanding, getting an understanding or a personal understanding of what that problem is, defining that problem, how, how we potentially can approach solving it, creating those ideas around solving that problem, prototyping it and testing it. And I'll, I'll take you through what that looked like in the context uh, of, of Gecko Tracks. So as I mentioned, you know, for us, it was about understanding what those people felt, whether it be talking to to other wheelchair users or, you know, even being in the wheelchair myself to understand how it feels, to feel that shoulder pain or the inability to be able to access, you know, a sandy surface. And then from that, we're able to define well, why exactly does a wheelchair get stuck in the sand? And, and for that, we sort of broke that down to a wheelchair will get stuck in the sand because there's not enough surface area uh, of the tire and that causes the wheel to sink. So we really set about how finding a unique and a portable way, uh, you know, portability was a key thing we found when, when speaking to, to wheelchair users. How can we create a portable way of allowing the wheelchair to do that? So we went away and come up with some, some crazy ideas from tank tracks to, you know, to sort of linkages. And then really the, the idea stemmed from, from, of where we sort of ended up really stemmed from, or in, from nature and how, how a gecko foot spreads out and hence the name, name gecko tracks. So from there, we sort of began prototyping it. And as you can see here, these are the first, very first prototypes of gecko tracks. It was literally just a 3D, hard 3D printed plastic piece to understand how this would feel or look um, clipped around and on road tire of a wheelchair. From there, we printed, you know, flexible material. We printed lots and lots of different pieces, gluing them together. Um, to create a full tire and to allow us to go and actually test test it on the beach. Went away and tested it and tried to understand, you know, another pain point we found was um, that people had to transfer out of their wheelchair for, for other products. And so we, we tried to understand, well, how can, we, how can we incorporate a clip or a mechanism to enable someone to fit the device uh, while they're still seated in the wheelchair? Hence, you can see there. So through testing, we're able to refine what that profile looked like like you know it's it's quite a simple product but the the um i guess the research and the, the development behind it certainly took quite a while to understand you know how to optimize that profile and then again testing it in a bunch of, of different terrains and environments to the point that we wanted to understand how exactly and this is probably the the engineer coming out in me but to understand fully in numbers how much more efficient that you know we'll we'll able to provi provide with the, the gecko tracks tires so now we're at the point uh, where we've created a mold, you know, created a mold, created the final the product and we've started to begin selling it. So you can see some of the photos there of, of our tooling in production a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is quite exciting. And so for us, you know, the James Dyson Award has, has been a huge help and support for us to be able to invest in this sort of tooling and, and get our product to market, but also it's been a great platform for us to be able to increase awareness around accessibility. Obviously, we were able to get quite a bit of international media and exposure through the award, which helped grow our brand, grow, grow our customer base, and ultimately increase uh, awareness about what we're trying to solve. So, I mean, really for us, the Gecko Tracks product is just one product of, of a whole range of products that is focusing on allowing people with disability to be able to get outdoors and enjoy the great outdoors, like many of us, you know, take for granted and, and really enjoy. So I thought I'd just leave you with, with the thought that empathy really requires that you know nothing. And I think some of the benefit of coming into a problem 
without having pre-existing ideas is, is one of the, the greatest powers because you can see sometimes things that others might not. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening to sort of what that process has been like with Gecko Tracks. I'd be, I'd be happy to take any questions now um, if you like, Jane. Otherwise, we can, can leave them to the end. Yeah, happy to take any questions if anyone wants to put them in the chat as we go. But thank you, Ryan. I think as well something to kind of highlight from Ryan's presentation was the slide he had on ID8 um, where the, you know, he kind of thought about the different ways that, or the different methods of what that wheel would look like to provide access. And that's something that we really want to see in the James Dyson Award is how you got to... Oh, so Johnny's just said that the chat is disabled. Um, as well, if that's okay, Nina. <laughs> but yeah, with that ideation process, you know, seeing how Ryan got to where he got to with kind of the gecko feet, we really want to see that in the process. So, you know, for example, James Dyson, when he invented the first bagless vacuum, that actually took over 5,000 prototypes for him to get to launching the first bagless vacuum. And so we don't look as um, at failures as failures, but almost successes for, you know, how you learn from them and then how you use that to, to get to where you are today. So, yeah, something that's really important throughout the JDA process as well. And, you know, really just mapping out that journey when kind of, you know, looking at your idea and, and how to kind of launch that or take that to market. So there's a question here, Ryan. How did you make time to work on it during uni? And was there a way to prototype on shoestring budget? Yeah. Um, so I guess you know, having a having Gecko Tracks, we, we sort of started it you know, very early on in, in my honours year at RMIT and were able to, um, I guess, develop it. It was something we were, we were doing anyway and, and incorporate it along with my studies. So I guess it was just a matter of, of, of prioritizing that as, as a project to, to spend time on during university. And then on the, on the, I guess, prototyping part on a shoestring budget, you know, nowadays, and, and you might want to touch on this late, like later, Jane, as well, especially with, with the impacts of, of COVID with maker spaces potentially not being so accessible, but you can, you can get a lot of learnings from, you know, basic cardboard or paper prototypes, depending on what your product is. But also, 3D printing is is super accessible now, so and and quite affordable. So doing that, and then if if you've got access to some of the university workshops, you know, definitely while you're still at university, make make use of that, and that's what we were, we were able to do as well. So before we even left university, towards the end, we we're able to actually create a full mold tire, which we were able to actually prototype some polyurethane parts out of, which ended up being our first pre-sale tyres. Yeah, that's a good point. So we're um, obviously very aware this year at the James Dyson Award that COVID-19 has impacted universities and students across the globe, um, particularly with access to studios, makerspaces, even being able to collaborate in teams with other people due to social distancing. So we're, we're very aware of that and really encourage um, students or graduates to still enter your idea even without a prototype um, if you've been unable to kind of get to that stage. But I guess my tip there is just to really map out what your idea would kind of look like um, through kind of models or sketches um, just to really show that process and, you know, kind of what's next. I'll just jump in there on behalf of the Sydney University and assuming that a lot of these people are members of the Sydney University community, the Tech Lab, which uh, is open for you and free and accessible. They run 3D printers, have uh, full-time staff to help you with learning how to code and build things with and without code. They are open and they can work with and liaise with you. They do one-on-ones for these kind of technical things. So that's a great resource if you're looking to develop these early MVPs. And the uh, Think Space, which is a part of the uh, library, Jane Foss Library, they'll be opening up soon with, uh, you know, social distancing and they have free 3D printers, 
cutters, laser cutters, um, and a bunch of other resources, um, you know, VR headsets and that kind of stuff that you can use for anything that you want, which would be the perfect way to kind of model and develop those early MVPs. That's great. Thanks, Nina. Um, so there's a few questions coming in, but what I might do is present um, some more questions, uh, sorry, some more slides on the James Dyson Award. Um, and then, yeah, as, as kind of some questions come through, both Ryan and I can answer those. So I'll just share my screen. So while we're just bringing those up, obviously uh, this is an amazing opportunity for anyone studying who has an idea that what they want to develop, but there are lots of other opportunities around um, both in independent competitions like the James Dyson, but also at, the, at Sydney Uni that offer um, equity-free cash prizes, um, workshops and free access to learning how to develop an idea and figure out if it's uh, something that has legs or has real impact in those ideation processes that Gecko Tracks referred to earlier. So you can find all of those on the Incubate website with our proto workshops um, or reach out for one of our drop-in sessions to kind of help you get your idea rolling. So yeah, just to give you kind of continue on with giving you some examples of um, what we see um, being entered into the JDA, we've got some other um, finalists from last year's award. So on the left hand side there, there is AFLO, which was from a student in the UK, and they were another international runner up. So AFLO is an AI enabled asthmatic trigger detecting device. It links to an app and collects data so individuals are more aware of what triggers their asthma and hopefully helps with some of their habits and behaviours. Gecko Tracks, as Brian has just showed you. Prolo, which was in the international top 20 from Japan, that is an interlocking system of the bike and bike helmet to prevent users, um, mostly children, from riding off without a helmet. Down the bottom on the left-hand side, there's there's the self-sanitizing door handle, which was also in the international top 20. And that is a handle that uses UV technology to sanitize the surface of the door handle. Kaylee from India is a mask and app for asthma sufferers in polluted environments that tracks air quality and administers asthma medication. And then Cocoon from the US is a portable safe space and alert device for epileptic sufferers. Some more success stories. So like Ryan, we've had some other JDA um, entrants that have gone on to commercialise and scale their inventions. So last year, um, the girl on the left-hand side is a girl named Lucy and her ID was Marina Tex and she was the international winner. Marina Tex, um, what she's holding up there, the plastic screen, is a new form of bioplastic made from organic waste from the fish processing industry and red algae. The two components bind to create a strong, flexible material that can be used as an alternative to single-use plastics. It can biodegrade in home compostable environments in four to six weeks, so it doesn't need its own waste management infrastructure like other bioplastics. Since winning the award, Lucy says her life has massively changed and she's now pursuing Marina Tech full time, has a new office space and interest from across the world. In the middle there, Solvega, um, she was the UK winner in 2014. Solvega entered her final year project, Bump Mark, into, into the James Dyson Award. And Bump Mark is a form of expiry label that uses gel technology to more accurately indicate when a perishable product has gone off helping to reduce food waste. Using the prize money from the JDA, she filed a patent for Bumpmark, rebranding it as Mimica. The exposure of winning the award meant Solvega was being approached by big consumer brands. She founded her own company and Mimica is scaling up for manufacture. Solvega travels around the world to talk about food waste at events like Summit in LA. On the right-hand side, we have Ryan, who was the UK winner in 2017 with his design Petite Plea. So Ryan entered his creative final year project as an aeronautical engineering master's student. Petite Plea, Petite Plea is a form of child's clothing that uses technology that allows the clothes to expand as a child grows. This reduces waste in the fashion industry. Since winning the award, he has founded Petite Plea as a company and like Solvega, he also travels around the world 
speaking at events about fashion and technology. So how does it all work and um, what's in it for you? So stage one is entries are open until the 16th of July and following um, that in July, a panel of three judges in Australia will select um, three entries to progress to the next stage and one of these will be declared the national winner, earning a cash prize of $3,500. Now, we're really excited this year. We actually have Ryan as one of our um, judges on the panel for Australia this year. Projects at this stage are judged on the strength of the entry, not just the invention itself. You'll need to communicate the significance of your invention, but also how the product was developed and how you reached your final design. Demonstrating an iterative trial and error approach will serve you well. Stage two in September at the international level um, the three finalists from the 27 countries across the world will then be looked at by a team of Dyson engineers and they will whittle those entries down to just a top 20. And they will look at how well each entry answers the brief, keeping commercial viability in focus, um, really considering if your product is something that people will want and can be manufactured. The final stage in October, um, the final 20 entries are reviewed by James Dyson himself he will hand select the international winner, two runners up and the sustainability winner. The international winner will receive $55,000 as well as a $9,500 fee for their university. The university prize money is offered to the design or engineering department through which you're eligible to enter for them to use in furthering education opportunities. The two international runners up will also receive $9,500. The sustainability winner will also receive $55,000. This is the first year that the James Dyson Award has introduced the sustainability winner, which is really exciting. Potential winners of this accolade will have paid close attention to their inventions part in today's sustainable agenda. This could be through its materials, design process, methods of manufacture, or even the solution to the invention itself. Now, it's also not just about the prize money. As Brian mentioned, um, he received lots of national and international media exposure, which is really great for um, being able to attract um, investment from other, you know, um, corporate companies. And as a little fact, one in five past winners who each received the $55,000 prize have gone on to successfully commercialise their inventions. So here's an example of just some of the media exposure that um, Gecko tracks and Ryan secured. So you'll see there was a news.com article. Ryan also did a TV news inter interview on ABC um, and even just, you know, EFTM, which is a nice um, tech and lifestyle publication as well. So as you can see from all of these examples and from Gecko tracks, um, the brief is simple. It's to design something that solves a problem. The best entries, those that win, put the problem they are solving at the forefront of their design. A design solution is only compelling when it is clear how it is solving a problem. And now we have the judging criteria, which I'll let Ryan take you through. Awesome. Thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, so as, as Jane mentioned, I'm actually going to be one of the judges this year for, for the James Dyson Awards, which is pretty cool for Australia. Um, so I thought I'd just take you through the design criteria and, and how you know, projects are selected um, based against that criteria. So... Obviously, the first one, you know, meeting the brief, does, does your idea solve a clear problem that is related to a social, global, or a sustainability issue? Um, and does it have the potential to impact or improve uh, people's lives? That's sort of that first criteria. Second one is explaining quite simply how it works. So has, has the idea been well thought through? Has it been well explained in, in the application um, and in doing that, you know, videos and photos are always great um, to, to help explain how that works. The other, other criteria in that is, you know, has it been designed or sourced with sustainability in mind as well? Have you considered the life cycle of the product? Have you considered the materials that's used and, and you know, what, what, what will the, pro, uh, the product be used for even once it's um, has, has no commercial use? Uh, then, one, one, another big thing for the criteria is 
as Jane mentioned, showing the design process, so showing those sketches, uh, the process of how you actually got to the final product because no, no product actually just sort of pops up. It's, it's really under, helping um, us and the other judges to understand what was that process, the sketches, what was the prototyping, you know, what um, experiments did you run to, to help prove out um, some of your assumptions. So again, you can be, you know, showing a lot of this through video or imagery um, to, under, to help us understand what, what were some of those um, processes. Then I guess understanding, you know, how, how your product is different. Uh, I guess this could also be considered your unique value proposition. Um, how does it differ from the current products in the market? What makes it unique? What makes it different? What makes it, um, you know, ideally superior to those other products? And then the real world application. Um, I, sometimes I guess designers or engineers can uh, design something that's really cool, but, you know, it needs to actually solve a problem and, and have potential to help people. Um, and so even if the idea or the, the product that you submit is not finished, what's, you know, allude to at least what what's your plan to commercialize and, and actually get that product out there to, to actually impact people. Does not have to be a full business plan? It's just sort of a, an, at least some thought gone into how, how is this? And then the final thing being, you know, clear, concise and well evidence. Again, that's just using um, great photos and videos and, and helping explain it quite easily to the judges. So that's sort of in a nutshell, what, what we're looking for is part of the... And actually, um, just as a nice little tip for everyone here today, I um, was also chatting with some other past winners from New Zealand and um, they were saying that before they entered their ID into the James Dyson Award, they had a look on the website um, at other entries. So you can actually go onto the website and you can see what Ryan entered when he submitted Gecko Tracks and you'll see all kind of the questions and the images. And to really yeah, take the time to go through some previous winners have a look at what they entered, how they described it, because there is a word limit on some of the on some of the questions, and also I think there's five questions. I mean, five images to submit. So have a look at what other people entered, um, and that might help with when entering the award for yourself. So how can you enter? You go to the website, the James Dyson Award website, www.jamesdysonaward.org. And you must be currently studying or have recently graduated in the past four years um, in industrial design or engineering. And you can enter singly or you can also enter as part of a team. So when entering the award, here are some of the questions that you will see. So what it does, so clearly explain what your invention does in no more than two sentences. Your inspiration, so this is where you need to explain the problem your invention is addressing and why your invention is necessary um, and important. How it works, clearly explain how your invention works in simple language, don't use jargon or overcomplicate it. Design process, describe and explain your iterative design journey. What problems have you faced? How did you overcome them? How has this process improved your invention? And make sure to provide images and videos. How, is, how it is different, as Ryan said, there are lots of concepts and designs out there. Why is yours unique? Future plans, what are your next steps? Are you filing a patent? Are you working through the design process? Are you ready to manufacture? And awards, have you won any other awards for your idea? Another little hot tip for you all is to, we would encourage you to um, draft your responses on a Word doc first and then um, copy those over to the website just so that you don't lose any information during the process. So some key dates, um, entries for the J. James Dyson Award closed 16th of July. The national winners and finalists will be announced the 17th of September. The Dyson Engineers Top 20 shortlist will be announced the 15th of October. And at the back end of the year, on the 19th of November, the international winner, sustainability winner, and the runners-up will be announced on the 19th of November. So that's it for the James Dyson Award. Um, so I can see there's a couple of questions so I guess this one um, I might go back up to some of the top 
Um, Ryan, for you, what is the toughest challenge throughout the whole process of bringing idea to production ready? Been uh, been quite a few challenges for sure. Uh, I think uh, starting out, I, I certainly underestimated you know just how long and just how much work it takes to actually bring something from from an idea to production. Um, and in reality, it seems that from bringing something from an idea to a prototype and and on is sort of you're only a quarter of the way there. So some of the challenges we've we've faced is around you know actually having enough resources or money to you know, invest in tooling um, has been one of the challenges, which certainly helped with um, James Dyson Award, like winning, winning that and some of the prize money received. And we're able to overcome uh, come some of that with accelerator programs we've been a part of and uh, some, gra- some grants that we've been lucky to receive. But probably the, probably the biggest challenge has actually been getting the product into production and, and relying on other people and uh, sort of external parties to, to design the tooling and, and all that sort of thing. So um, it's certainly been, a, been an awesome learning curve. And yeah, I'd say the two biggest ones sort of in summary is has been resources or money and actually production or manufacture. And I think another one for you, Ryan, um, how do you manage data? What are some of the methods or technology that you use to manage that? I'm not sure what you mean exactly by data. I guess if you're talking about CAD files and, and design files and that sort of thing. It's, it's very much, uh, I just have a, quite a, a process of filing to keep it all, all neatly in the computer because you can certainly lose a lot of those early ideas. They're, they're super, super important to keep so that you, know, you can show some of those early design processes. So if it's a sketch or um, you know, always scan it in or if it's, you know, if it's digital, keeping that in, in neatly labeled files is super important. But for, from our point of view, we're not dealing with sort of, you know, large amounts of data other than that. So I probably can't answer, answer to that. Saw one there from Eric as well. What's next for Gecko Tracks? So for us, you know, we, we're, we've, we've had pre-sales and we're, we're just about to finalise the first production run of, of Gecko Tracks, which is super exciting. It's been, been quite a journey getting there. So for that, we'll be sort of scaling up within Australia. We'll be selling directly to people but also through a network of of resellers which we've got lined up now and then as soon as we can we want to be taking the product global so the US is the first point of call for us and then it won't be just gecko tracks but we'll be working on production of of other assistive technology that allows people with disability wheelchair users to to get outdoors and not just the beach but you know going for a hike in a national park or something like that so we essentially want to become an outdoor brand for people with disability. Yeah, and there's another question here. So does it have to be a problem per se? Can it not be an innovative improvement? So I guess from a James Dyson Award perspective, we are really looking for those kind of unique ideas. But if there's something that you have in mind or you're working on and it's kind of an improvement on something that exists, I guess my recommendation or suggestion would be to look at why are you innovating? Why are you making it a, an innovative improvement on it? What is the problem or the issue that you see or that some consumers may see, whatever it may be? And then why are you going down that process? And I guess that would be what you would really um, need to talk up and address in your submission process. On that too, I think, you know, as, as engineers, it can be just fun to create things as well. So something you've you know, and I'm guilty of that too, but some of the things you've got to be sort of aware of is, I guess, be married to your problem, not your solution. So really understand what, what your problem is you're solving and then your solution will differ depending on, you know, what feedback you get along the way. You might show some prototypes early on and, and the feedback isn't so great. So don't be too tied to that solution. Change and, and just be fixated on how you can solve that problem that you started out with. Can people apply multiple times? You can. So if you've got different projects, you can enter that. Also, if you did enter your idea last year, you can enter that again this year, but you would need to show um, what progress or progression has been made as well. Another question we've been asked a lot too is around IP and 
people stealing your ideas. So I thought I'd just jump onto that one before it gets asked. The firstly, like, you know, Jane, Jane, you can talk to this, but James Dyson Award doesn't own any IP. It's, it's all your, your own, but obviously being quite a large platform, um, your, your idea will be exposed to the, um, and in my experience, you know, people, people aren't out there to steal your idea. They've got their own things to worry about. So it's, it's the likelihood is pretty low, but um, that being said, if, if your idea is, you know, something quite significant, then you might want to be applying for a patent or, or some form of, of IP protection. And if your project is actually already online and publicly available, then that can very much hinder or actually stop you from applying for a patent. So that's something just to be aware of. Again, James Dyson isn't around to, to take the ideas. It's they're, they're all your own, but it's just protecting yourself from, from everyone else that can, can see into the platform. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Ryan. It's um, yeah, something to be aware of and we do encourage you to speak to any kind of local teams around filing for you know, IP or a patent, but it is kind of up to you. I mean, an example there was Solvega, Mimica, what she used her prize money after being successful in the James Dyson Award to then file for a patent. So yeah, just yeah, definitely something to think about if you are entering an idea. And on that too, I don't know, you know, maybe the University of Sydney might have, you know, help for for people wanting to understand what that process looks like too. Um, I know That's RMIT exactly can, right. That help, I was so. about to jump in. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. That's uh, Incubate uh, and Genesis and the Innovation Network. We all exist to help everyone within the University of Sydney community explore that point. So from ideation all the way up into commercialisation and patents and all of that. So if there's any questions around that, we're very happy to help, and which is also why we're so happy and delighted to be able to host you guys because this is just one of the multiple of, you know, opportunities that people can extend their ideas and what an amazing story you have. Thank you so much, Ryan. No worries. Thank you. Any other, other questions yeah. that we should answer? It's so impressive. They're stunned. You've answered all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was incredibly useful. And what an extraordinary story. I, I think it's, it's really um, heartening to see exactly that, you know, you marry yourself to the problem and you can really solve all types of extraordinary things. That, those, that list of winners it was quite high calibre thing, something incredibly, um, something you should be incredibly proud of. My other question um, I thought on that was, um, are people able to um, get feedback from their applications? So, you know, potentially if someone hears, you know, maybe not ready but would like to put a submission to get some feedback, is that possible? Yeah, so I will um, actually see all of the entries that come in mm -hmm. um, and get to review um, those entries. So if I, and I'll read through all of those. So if there's any areas where I think, oh, maybe dial this up a bit more or maybe show the, the iterative process a bit more because you've missed that, um, mm -hmm. I can send um, some feedback through the website um, to that student or graduate. So yeah, I can definitely do that. And then following the process, I'm not, I don't think we would kind of, because we do kind of receive a lot of entries, provide feedback to everyone. But obviously you all know me now. So um, <laughs> if there is, you know, if that is the case, then by all means, feel free to kind of reach out. Beautiful. Everyone who's attending today, I'll send you all out an email with direct links to um, the competition's website and the FAQs. And if you want any further directions, I'm sure if you reach out via their social media or website, Jane will be able to get back to you on that, anything you have. Likewise, yeah, that, I think, Crete, this is, you know, just the start of a conversation. Like, yeah. you know, I'm more than happy to, to answer any other sort of further questions. If someone wants to reach out directly, yeah, you can find my email on, on my LinkedIn or... Um, I'm sure you can share it around Nina as well. So. I can add it in. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much, Ryan. No worries. Brilliant. Well, this has been absolutely extraordinary. If there's nothing else that anyone would like to flag, I'd just honestly like to thank you so much for your generosity with your time. Um, Jane and Ryan, that's been absolutely brilliant. We've got another event, if anyone else is interested, uh, next Tuesday on the importance of diversity in innovation. So this touches almost uh, to the heart of, you know, inclusivity um, that you're really passionate about, Ryan. So that's really a lovely kind of tie-in with this fortnight. Um, and we've got the co-founder of Wear It Purple, 
speaking on the importance of how diversity and as representative of minorities in startups and businesses is critical for the future of innovation. So if anyone would like to join us on that, um, it's free. Just sign up on our Facebook and we'd love to have more voices and more questions there as well. Awesome. Thanks, Wonderful. Dana. Thanks Thank so much so for much. having us, everyone. Thanks for <laughs>